case you were wondering, this is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're talking about uh, Coronaville. Uh, Coronaville, what's next? And um, the title of our discussion this morning is, where does COVID fit in the impeachment we've all been watching? Does it play a role in possible conviction? Uh, with our guests, Tim Apicella, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, Stephanie Dalton, Winston Welch. Welcome to the show, you guys. Regular contributors. Good morning. Aloha. Good morning. Aloha. Okay, if you've been watching the impeachment proceedings, raise your right hand. What? 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 <laughs> okay. I, I, you, know, I'm, you know, yesterday and today have been very interesting. Um, but what the discussion is today is actually more interesting to me than, than before. And that is the, the Democrats' portrayal of Trump's failure of remorse and his galvanization of the Proud Boy and other ultra-right-wing movements elements of his movement. Um, this is actually scarier to me. We've already seen, you know, pretty much what went on in the Capitol on, on January 6th, although we learned a lot of new stuff yesterday, but we hadn't heard about the FBI's, um, you know, uh, uh, investigation and examination of what was going on with the, the, galvanization, the galvanization of the Proud Boy movement. So my first question, Tim, is, um, this is pretty scary stuff. I don't know if it's as scary for you as it is for me, but they said they'll be back. They said there'll be more violence. Uh, they're just waiting for his instructions. So my question to you is, will the country survive? Will, will this depend on, what will this depend on? And how much will it depend on the verdict in these proceedings? Got any thoughts on that? The country will survive. I agree. It's scary. And, and I think what scares me the most is the reaction of Republican senators faced with this undeniable evidence, undeniable role that Donald Trump played in this whole business. And they're not willing to entertain the seriousness of conviction of impeachment. That's what scares me. Because if they're willing to look over this one, what else are they going to just look past? And so um, the country will survive. We'll get through this. I think it's going to polarize neighbor against neighbor for a while. Uh, I know I feel polarized. For if, it, if I have any friend, family or friends that are, you know, pulling for Donald Trump on this, this trial, um, I don't want to talk to them. I really don't. And it's sad because, uh, you know, these are people I love. And it, but it says something about, in my opinion, their moral character and their dedication to this country and the constitution and, and the, the rule of law and the democracy of, of this country. So I, I take it to heart and it, it bothers me and maybe I'll go back to losing sleep again. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, the country's gonna pull together and Joe Biden will get some of these policies uh, implemented and, and passed and the country will improve and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get better. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's optimistic. Um... Cynthia, let me throw one other element in the pot, uh, which a friend of mine brought up in a conversation this morning. You know, if you, if you hit two, two sides of the divisiveness against each other, that is the ultra-right and, and the regular people, call them the liberals if you want, but I think they're the regular people. Um, and one side has guns and the other side doesn't have guns. One side has sworn to use the guns uh, you know, against iconic figures in our government. And the other side mm, won't use guns. They don't have guns. They're not about to get into violence. Does that change what Tim was saying? Will the country survive? Well, I have hope that the country will survive. But I don't have certainty that it will. I don't feel like it's just it's a done deal. We will for sure make it because there's so many people that I hear like the the um, the report, the memo that we got from somebody that said all of the things that they're saying, you know, the Republicans are saying all this far right stuff. All of the people that I know that are far right that are still down in the south where I used to be, um, they still think this was stolen. They still think that Biden is an illegitimate president. And as long as that mentality continues, even with normal people, not just the far left crazy people, but the normal Republicans that still believe this stuff, how do we 
reach out to them and help them to see the truth. That I don't know. But I know that we have to keep trying, right? Because that is where our hope lies. Our hope lies in all of the rest of the normal people, as you call them, reaching out to those people that are still lost in a sea of misinformation. It's not an easy job, but I think we have to try. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you mean by try or what we can do. We, you know what we can do? We can have this program. That's what we can do. No. Um, so, uh, you know, Winston, I, I sent around an article that really impressed me, and it was by a, a woman named uh, uh, Jean Steinberg. Mm -hmm. I think it's Steinberg. And I sent it around last night. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. But it tracks on Ann Applebaum, who wrote for The Atlantic uh, three or four months ago, and who compared uh, the history of Eastern Europe with what is happening now. Steinberg compared the history of, of um, Germany, mostly, uh, with what is happening now. And it is a very chilling discussion. And what it says, uh, you know, along, along the lines I was mentioning before, is if one side has guns, and the other one doesn't, it's not a fair fight. And if one side has been galvanized, as the testimony came out this morning, by Trump's um, you know, efforts to bring them together, to, mit to knit them together into a, a fighting force, an army, a movement, um, that really you know, puts us uh, behind the eight ball. And there's a, in, that, in that article, there's a list of like five steps along the way um, to get to a dictatorship. And the second step is... is, is Having vi using violence to take over government institutions. So we're on the track that she describes. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Where are we in terms of, you know, the survival of the, the, the country? Well, you, as you might have gleaned, I'm typically optimistic about uh, things and see the glass half full when I wake up. And if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I get up and get up on the other side of the bed when I can. These are extraordinary times. If we um, haven't been uh, sobered by what's happened, by the riveting testimony and, um, and prosecution in the Senate today, yesterday and the day before, and I urge all people to go to C-SPAN or whatever, and they are watching it. There's, there's so many hits on C-SPAN. It's, it's heartening to hear that. Now, you know, you know, Winston, somebody told me today, unbelievable, that Fox News is not carrying it. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Isn't that Fox incredible? It's so not. Most people yet. that follow Fox News have no idea what we are learning. That's right. And that's, that was, a, I was getting to that. Is that we're, half the nation is watching this. The people that are tuning in are folks that, although we welcome a variety of, of viewpoints on, uh, on think tech and have all manner of, of you know, of politics on these shows. This one specifically, we may have, uh, you know, certain uh, thoughts about, and we welcome our viewers that, you know, that are watching to, to help us understand why did you believe this man and what, why don't you see what we see? Uh, it, it, there's got to be something after this. And this is where I'm interested in sort of moving beyond is how do we get people to even understand the same basic facts. And we are not dealing in a nation that is having the same basic facts. You look at people, ind independents, whatever they are, um, are tend to uh, look like Democrats when they say, who is president of the United States? Who's the legitimately elected president of the United States? Republicans um, and We'll say that the ones that you know have uh, limited news sources, let's just say, um, have been co-opted by those news sources so that they have an entirely different worldview. How do we get to a point where we are all watching Walter Cronkite again, uh, who, by the way, is a little bit before my time, but I get you get the idea of it that that or Mr. Brinkley or oh, who was the other one? In any event, we we have to learn how to communicate with each other to understand beyond um, the rhetoric what's going on. And I think the Senate has laid out a pretty convincing argument here. I haven't heard that on the other side from uh, what's going on, what, what the uh, defense will present. And their argument obviously won't resonate with us, but um, it'll be see interesting to see how the spin is there. 
our nation is has seen um, really difficult times right now. Uh, we're in a di difficult existential moment, I would say. Um, we're not having you know blood spilled on the streets, but you're right. We're on a on a march to um, a strong man or a lack of democracy, and we saw this almost happen a month just a month ago here. So, while being generally optimistic, I think we all need to go back to the history books, read those things. How does fascism happen? What steps can we take to to prevent it? And uh, and how do we learn to communicate with people, especially, I mean, starting with those we love, but how do we learn at the very top to reach the Murdochs and say, you won't have a nation to broadcast in to make the money from selling soap if you continue down this path. And so, I, I hope he thinks of that, but meanwhile, he's cleaning up. Yes. So Stephanie, you know, one of the interesting parts of what happened on January 6th is why well, it stopped. <laughs> and apparently it stopped because they couldn't find Nancy. Uh, they, they couldn't find Pence. Um, they couldn't find uh, Schumer. Uh, I think uh, injured, killed, or kidnapped them if they could find them. Luckily, they didn't. They, and they couldn't find the ballots. And, and when this was known uh, to Trump, who I believe, I believe that Trump was in touch moment by moment, real time, with the leaders you know, who were, you know, leading the, the crowd, the mad crowd, try to find these things. Uh, when he learned that they could not be found and they'd been spirited away, then he called it off. He said, go home. And that's why they went home. If the search had continued, the search had been successful for those things, I suggest to you they would not have gone home. And I suggest the next time they do this, and they have said they would, they won't go home. What are your thoughts? Um, and what does it depend on? Will the movement be reactivated after this, uh, these impeachment proceedings? Uh, and assuming for a moment that, um, that you can't get 17 um, Republican senators to vote for impeachment, will that accelerate the movement? Or if the movement does impeach um, Trump, uh, will that accelerate the movement? What does acceleration of the movement depend on? Um, you um, are, the, the, that's a chilling question, Jay. Uh, you know, I uh, personally thank you for that. I was fighting meltdown this morning while I was watching Fox News show the impeachment trial. And my meltdown was, as already has been mentioned, is, you know, I have adult family here that I love dearly, but they're on the, uh, that's that problem of they're on the other side. And I'm starting to get viscerally uh, involved in that. And I, 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 that, that's my, my meltdown thing is that, how to handle that, as well as just in general, the deplorable uh, way that Fox presented, well, the, the Fox newscasters, Barbie and Ken, you know, were kind of neutral, but then they brought on the, um, the second uh, um, uh, defender of Trump is he, whatever his name is. I'm sorry, there are two of them. He's the second one that didn't didn't he's, make the. Um, I, I, okay, but anyway, he came on and he went through their litany of what they're going to present next, and they just can't wait till they have their time because they didn't really have their time on the uh, opening because they were really trying to do something else there, and that that was not well enough prepared. They were limited in time, all these excuses, and then of course, what's coming on that they're going to do is uh, to 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 help everybody understand what, what's going on here that there is a glorification of violence and there's a disunifying theme here that's going to just put Americans one against the other. It's all decontextualized about Trump. Everything is taken out of context and everything he said is is negatively interpreted and there and it's unfair to focus and um on these misrepresentations of his mentioning of peace and his mentioning of fighting hard which any patriot is going to be proud of so i'm just about ready to have my meltdown there now you bring this up <laughs> because i i realize they have no uh, they're not open to what was so beautifully presented this morning in the in 
in the statements, which had to do with a comprehensive review in, and in a holistic way, what Trump had done over time to get these people to be where they were. So and as you heard, point. all the, the way back to the Michigans and the taking of the governor. And what you're evoking, what you're evoking, Jay, is this is a bloodlust. They're, that they have said things about blood running out of the Capitol. They did read emails about that. And it's a bloodlust, so they would have, maybe they would have done that. I don't know, but if they haven't done it, can they be held back to not do it? Well, or I don't they know. That's the question here. But, but Tim, let me move closer to the core point of our discussion, which is about COVID. Um, you know, we learned yesterday and today uh, that, that Trump was setting this up for a long time. And, you know, it wasn't just that day. It was months and it was part of his plan to stay in power. And then you realize that he, is, he filed for re-election um, at the time he was, he was inaugurated in January 2017. Uh, he's been running for office the whole time. He really, really, really wanted to stay in power. <clears throat> okay, and now we have COVID. And COVID rears its head in late January, early February. Um, and he has, he has taken certain steps steps to deny it, um, to call it the flu, steps, steps to change the numbers, uh, steps to make the people feel, the public feel that it's not as serious as it was. He has lied to us on many, many occasions. He has caused other people to lie to us over the entire period of, of, of the COVID uh, tragedy. Um, and so we find that his efforts preceded January 16. And really what I want to get to is the, the connection between this insurrection on January 16th and his moves on COVID. Because I believe that there is a connection. And I believe also that COVID, this is a separate issue, COVID is in the room. COVID is in that impeachment. This is a terrible, terrible president. But I think it goes further than that. I think he was taking steps on COVID to enhance his opportunities at re-election. Um, and he was governing everything he did in COVID to make it better for his re-election. The only problem for him was that he ran out of luck, that it kept on getting worse despite his lies. And by, what, November, people understood there was a serious problem. So my question to you is, what do you think about that? What's the connection between COVID, which we here have followed for the whole year, and and the impeachment and the feeling about the feeling about the about Trump in the Senate discussion, in the trial, and in the public? Donald Trump would have been a second term president had it not been for COVID. There's no two ways about that. Donald Trump did everything he could back in early March. And you and I did a show about this in early March basically calling it a flu. And he wanted to make sure that the financial markets were not impacted. So that's why he denied it. That's why he wouldn't wear a mask. That's why he said, don't wear a mask, uh, basically, we had all his rallies and the things that we saw for, for nine, nine months up, up until the election. So Donald Trump had bad timing. I agree with you 100%. And the death toll kept rising and that didn't help his election chances. And then finally the death toll got to the point where now it was affecting uh, the Trump states, the red states, uh, the families of voters for Trump, is, they started to die. And these people started to realize that, no, COVID is a real disease and it's killing people and it's killing his voters. And so it was bad timing and Donald Trump couldn't twist, twist COVID in order to get him and gain him the election. So he had to do what he tried to do in the first election, that is call it a fraud. And Donald Trump did exactly that. The second he knew that mail-in ballots were going to be used, he said, it's rigged, it's going to be fraudulent. He did that months before the election. And, and, and he has followed through consistently. And I just want to raise one point because when Donald Trump said, you know, go home, he didn't just say go home. He said the following. These are events and things that happen when election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots 
who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home, love and peace. Remember this day forever. Well, we will remember this day forever, but this is classic example how Donald Trump uh, thinks that the people who stormed the Capitol are patriots and they're not. And by the way, those who stormed the Capitol to tie it into COVID infected a lot of police and a lot of their fellow um, insurrectionists. Uh, the, the, the case numbers have gone up skyrocketed since that, in, uh, that insurrection of the Capitol. So uh, that's what I have in my mind. Yeah, before you, before you get off on the notion of public health, I am, I am beside myself about the suicide of two of the police there. They never got into it, but it, it strikes me that must have been a horrible experience for them and their families. Can you imagine? These are ordinary working guys, policemen, all of a sudden in their lives, they're committing suicide. You can imagine how they felt to go to that level. Well, I hate to say it, but I, I'm sure they felt they failed in their task and their duty. Mm -hmm. uh, su suicide's never, you know, it's a long, you know, it's a short-term solution to a long-term problem, but I I'm sure they felt mortified that what happened happened on their watch. Yeah. And by the way, the senators, the GOP senators should feel the same way. They, this happened on their watch and they should be cognizant of that. And they should really pay attention to these proceedings and grow a conscience and do something about it. Yeah, well, some of that must uh, uh, inspire you to make some thoughts, Cynthia. What do you think? It does. My biggest thing, and I've been talking about this for weeks now, is how bad it is that they hung those boys out to dry the way they did. They knew there was going to be violence. They knew full well there was going to be violence. There was a, a report on the 5th of January that actually went out with, from the FBI saying that there was going to be war on the Capitol. We won't give up. These were some of the things that they had intercepted on Parler um, and some of these other sites that um, there's going to be war. We won't give in. We won't stop till we get our president back. Nothing else will do. Things like that. And they, and they put it out there. So the biggest one that hit me out of all of the presentations was when uh, Swalwell, Representative Swalwell did his, and it was about the police, the Capitol Police. And they begged, you can hear them for the first time, you hear them radio, radio in to say, we need help, we're overrun. They were crying for help for two hours. Two hours they cried for help. Winston, I want to raise one thing with you. <clears throat> you know, uh, that is clear from today, anyway, um, that there will be more of that these guys are they're they're conglomerated they're consolidated around the country and uh, not only in attacking uh, you know the capital again but also attacking state state institutions um, and the level of confusion the level of misinformation is is astronomical I mean right now the you know Trump is blaming Biden for COVID he's saying Biden is doing a bad job COVID. And there'll be more. I mean, everything that Biden is doing, Trump will blame him for. Everything that goes wrong, and some of it, Trump will make it go wrong. Trump Can will blame him for it. And, and his friends in the Senate will, will do the same. So my question is, you know, how, how can we survive if this is going on? How can the Biden government do on COVID when you have Trump attacking him this way? Um, how, you know, um, the, 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 it's entirely possible that we'll have a new pandemic with the variants um, and that, you know, we'll be in worse shape in a few months for one reason or another. How does that feed into Trump's lies going forward? Can I just really quickly give you what the Times report is for today on the virus? This is this morning's report, right? Uh, it says it's been a long time since the virus news was an, as encouraging as it is right now. So for all this, Biden's doing bad. We have the overall situation is bad. The virus is spreading more rapidly in the U.S. than any other large country. And more than 2,500 Americans are dying daily. But <laughs> it is a marked difference than last year. 
I, I mean, then uh, last month we are. So let's assume that for a moment. Does that help Trump or hinder Trump? I mean, that, Trump could say, "Well, Biden hasn't hasn't really terminated the pandemic, um, so he's at fault for not doing that." Or does it does it hinder Trump um, by saying, um, "You know, uh, look what a good job Biden is doing." How is I, this going to play in Trump's attempts to come again to power? I think it hinders him because there's a market decline in viruses. And part of the reason they're contributing to that is that they're saying that it's the, the vaccines. So it, he hasn't even been in there a month and we've already got a marked decline. So it's pretty hard to say Biden's doing a bad job. Um, can I just insert, he's 61% favorable. They're all uh, clapping about that. But I wanted to just say, and I know it's Winston's turn, but I, the, I also looked at Johnson and Johnson this morning, thinking about their stock and what's going to happen. But the CEO of J and J is saying that what the the uh, variation is coming, and we have no no way to stop it. So it's just really, really uh, chilling again. And uh, on the other hand, <laughs> there's good news out of it because that might be a unification for the U.S. Because if we can't combat this virus. Uh, we have we are going to have a lot of community over how what we're going to do if it's truly deadly for all all of us. So that J and J uh, CEO will probably be you probably hear from him later. Well, Winston, that ought to give you plenty of material to make a comment about. <laughs> God bless America. Uh, I I back you know the, our, our show is ostensibly coronaville uh, and 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 all of that, but it's obviously just just so part and parcel hit gum in the hair for, for the political, um, you know, challenges that we face here. But, at, at, you know, Stephanie's, yeah, th that's interesting news. I wonder what happened to their stock when he came out with that statement. Did it go up or down? No, the, we've got a lot of problems in this nation. We're facing them with a sane, sober, reasonable, um, adult in charge with great people in his cabinet that we can trust to do the right thing. We have to let them do their job. The, the, the huge majority of Americans know that he is the president, that he is making the best decisions on their behalf. And we uh, have to trust in that process and having uh, just, just looking at this PTSD of the, the trial of the last three days and the chaos that we faced every single hour for the last four years. And then you look at whatever Biden did today or you tomorrow or yesterday, he's running the country. He's doing a competent job, more than competent. He's doing a stellar job, especially given what he's have to deal with. So let's give it some time. Let's exercise personal and societal responsibility. Let's reach out to our friends and family and try and help them um, understand our thinking in the gentlest way that we can so that we can come together and we don't have to have mask wars or other stupid, just distractionary stuff. We've got a lot of challenges, but we're, we're more than up to um, the task of facing them together. Yeah, Stephanie, what, what troubled me, what troubles me is that um, the, there's only one article of impeachment and it, it's not about COVID. And uh, to the extent that it's in the room, it hasn't really been discussed much. And, uh, well, I think Jim is so right on. Do you yeah. think that had there been no insurrection, whether Trump could have been impeached simply on the basis of his lies around COVID? No. I, I agree with Tim. I think uh, COVID's been a gift. Um, without COVID, he would have had so much charge um, of the economy and other uh, other of his um, what he thinks are accomplishments, it would have been hard to beat him. But now we we did beat him, and my my uh, my energies are about how do we get the Republican people to be public servants and not self interested and politically motivated. They've been mentioning this through the in the the, the presentations of, in the Senate that they're there to be public servants and to represent the the people, and so how can we encourage people to connect with their representatives and their senators to get them to do what's obviously the right thing? I, I can't believe the people so, of every state. But Tim, I want to shift gears a little bit for you know final comments here. 
And that is this, you know, watching this is, is so compelling. It's compelling on the evidentiary side of what happened, you know, in the, in the course of the insurrection. It's compelling on how, it, how Trump led up to it. And this was part of a, a whole, whole uh, plan, a scheme, um, an organizational arrangement with his supporters. I'm sure there were telephone calls galore all around the country. While COVID was burning up our, our people, while they were dying at this rapid rate, and while he wasn't doing a damn thing about it, not a damn thing about it, he's, he's got the time to call all these people and organize the skinheads. Quite extraordinary. So yes. this is obvious. It's obvious to somebody in Paris or London or or Berlin, it's obvious to anyone in Asia, it's obvious. How do you think they feel about what's coming out here, what's coming about, out about the plan, the scheme uh, that Trump was involved in, uh, what's coming out about the skinheads, and ultimately, within a few days, an acquittal? How do you think America's stock looks to them? Well, that shining city on the hill is not so shining. And I think the rest of the world is disappointed in where we're at. I think they're optimistic that President Biden will lead us out of this darkness. I believe that uh, they're willing to overlook this last four years as an anomaly. And God bless them for doing that because, you know, these are our trusted partners for, for decades and decades, and they're still hanging tight with us. Whereas you would think maybe many other countries and other peoples would say, America is hopeless, but they're sticking by us. They're our allies. And that's a great thing. And it's my only hope that Joe Biden get past this. And I'm sorry, but until we start reading the same facts on the same page, I'm not sure we get out of this. And again, I don't know if that's multi-billion dollar lawsuits against irresponsible media companies or is that the FCC cracking down, finally, getting back to the days of Walter Cronkite, Chet Huntley, and Brinkley? Um, I don't know where that starts, but until we start agreeing on the same facts and reading the same facts, I don't see a way out of this. Okay, last comments. Uh, Cynthia, what do you got? Okay, I have a, an article that Winston sent me that I want everybody to know about and I want everybody to go read. And it's in Vice News and it's... Um, by Greg Walters, and it's titled, Here's How the GOP Could Convict Trump Without Even Voting. So the, uh, apparently the way the Constitution is written, it says three quarters of the senators present. So if those chicken guys can't stand up and do the right thing, just stay home. And it's an easy out for them too, because they can say, well, it's not a legitimate thing anyway. And they can okay. just- uh, what about what, what about what about Mc, uh, Mitch McConnell, Winston? All he would have to do is say, "Follow me, boys. We're going to convict." Wouldn't that change the world? Yes, it would. Well, you'd hope so. But it's like I said yesterday. Six years from now, it's going to be Mitch McConnell, colon D, colon, uh, running for office because his party won't exist anymore. He needs to stand up and do the right thing as a man, as an American. Uh, as a person of conscience. And maybe, and he's told his people they can do what they want. If they held a secret vote, mm -hmm. zero doubt that this would be absolute conviction. Why don't they? Why can't I don't know why they don't. I, <laughs> that, that, would, that would ensure it. A vote no, on no interest. Stephanie, your last okay. comments? Last comment is that Tim's points are good, but you know what? All of our allies have been through this. They're watching us to see what how we can do it better. Can we do it better? They all have been through it, have had wars over it, and have had to recover from that, had to have our help. Now it's us. So let's just see what the outcome is. I, I yeah, believe we'll it. See what this country is really made of. It can be. It can be, guys. We're out of time. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Stephanie. Another great discussion and another inflection point in American history and in our future here on the planet. I hope to see you all in person soon. Or well, putting it another way, I hope I will see you again in person. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs>